Welcome to the Stranded Technologies Podcast. I'm your host and founder of Infinita Fund, Nicholas Anzinger. In this show, we talk about how to accelerate the future. Our thesis is that many life improving technologies are held back by institutional barriers. How can we unblock vast opportunities while mitigating against the risks? What ethical principles, rules, and regulations can guide us on that path? We will discuss these questions with entrepreneurs, policymakers, and industry experts. If you enjoy the show, please give us five stars and visit us at infinitafund.com to join the community. All right, today is December the 30th and 2022, and my guest is Adeo Resi. Adeo Resi is the CEO of VC Lab, which runs the leading venture capital accelerator. He's also the executive chairman of the Founder Institute, the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. Adeo has launched 14 venture capital funds and founded 11 startups, having nearly 2 billion in exits before the age of 30. Adeo is an iconic entrepreneur, investor, and teacher. I consider him something like my Jedi master as I went through the VC Lab program and graduated this year. Adeo, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Excited to be here. Adeo, besides what I said about you, anything else you would like listeners to know about you and your background? Not to nitpick, I probably launched more than 14 funds because I've been involved in the launching of a variety of others where I wasn't a general partner. And I served on the board of the X Prize for 10 years, funded a lot of the first X Prize that won private space exploration goal and we've done a lot of different things, but it was pretty good overall and simple and short. Fantastic. How would you describe your mission with VC Lab? So VC Lab is designed to turn venture capital into a force for good in the world. If you look at what has happened in part because of the efforts of the Founder Institute, you have now a thriving entrepreneurial ecosystem in almost every country on the planet. So from Mongolia to Namibia, there are entrepreneurs working to solve small problems and large problems in most major cities, most secondary cities, and pretty much across the entire face of the planet. The problem, however, is that venture capital, the main means of providing professional funding to those entrepreneurs only exists in a few select cities around the world, such as Silicon Valley, London, New York, et cetera. And what happens is entrepreneur in an emerging market or even a developed market that doesn't have a thriving venture capital ecosystem, they may go into an accelerator and get some support and funding. And then they may be able to raise some angel capital from local wealthy individuals who are interested in the angel support role, but then they reach a glass ceiling and there's no ability for them to get professional capital to scale without leaving their city or leaving their country and going to where these venture capital ecosystems are thriving, such as again, London, Silicon Valley, New York, Berlin, et cetera. And that's really not a viable way to build a global revolution to change the world in the ways that are needed, right? Because we can't solve problems in Africa from Europe. We can't help people in LATAM from North America. We need people on the ground, building solutions to problems on the ground, where they are. And then when those solutions prove to be commercially viable, they need the professional funding to scale. And the ideal source of professional funding is someone in the local market that also understands the local problems natively. And then many of those problems that may start out as local will end up being these global behemoths. Like Slack was started in Vancouver and Spotify was started in Sweden. But these entrepreneurs can start things and gain traction locally wherever they are in the world. And you're going to see fintech innovations coming out of Africa, social innovations coming out of Indonesia, and those innovations will work in the local markets, but they'll also have a global market. So we're going to see a renaissance 
in entrepreneurship, but also a renaissance in venture capital. Because as these entrepreneurs build solutions in their local markets that can scale globally, they will also be ideally funded by local venture capitalists who will then reap the benefits of creating global behemoths from LATAM, from Africa, from the Middle East, and from places where we really just haven't seen a lot of unicorns and global success stories today. This is all happening now and will start to flourish over the next few years. So I really see this as a renaissance period in entrepreneurship, a renaissance period in venture capital, and that's going to create a renaissance period for humanity. And VC yeah. Lab's gonna power it. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This podcast is all about removing obstacles for entrepreneurship to thrive. And you're basically allowing venture capital to flourish and globalize all over the world to empower these entrepreneurs. And in the process, you're removing obstacles to starting a venture capital fund, which is something that we're going to learn a lot about. But before we get there, before talking about the black box that venture capital has been for a very long time, can you talk a bit about what makes venture capital so powerful, which gives it the potential to be such a positive force? Inherently, venture capital is not necessarily powerful and the same way that money itself isn't powerful or money isn't good or bad money is just money and venture capital is just venture capital however ethical venture capital is very powerful and definitely a force for positive change in the world because if what's happened to date with venture capital is that you've had generalist funds who are really just out there to make money, right? So their goal is I have $1 and I need to turn it into 10 and I can invest in anything to make that happen. And that is, it's not a bad motivation, but it's not a great motivation because a lot of times in order to take that $1 and turn it into $10, they have to do some unethical things. And so you've seen an industry who with generalist funds oftentimes engaged in unethical behavior. And the FDX most recent example is a perfect one because here are some of the largest funds in the world, generalist funds that back this uh, exchange and th that was engaged in undeniably bad, unethical behavior. And no one managed to catch it. Uh, and, and to some extent, I'm not even sure if they really cared enough to catch it, right? Because it, it wasn't all that <laughs> difficult to figure out, right? You can look at a balance sheet, you can look at any sort of statement of cash flows, and you're like, wait a minute, what's going on here? Why is this money leaving the exchange and going into over here? And you know, this isn't, you don't need Inspector Clouseau to figure out that they're taking money or robbing Peter essentially to pay Paul. But that's just because, again, you have these generalist funds and they, their mission is to take $1 and turn it into 10. Now, what we are doing at VC Lab and what I think the future of venture capital is, is specialist investors. These are people who understand a segment or a market or even a geography very, very well. And they are looking to invest with an ethical code of conduct. Right. So now it's not, let me invest in anything and try and make a quick buck. They're saying, look, I'm going to focus on precision neuroscience or regenerative agriculture or whatever specialized areas where they have domain expertise. And because they have this domain expertise and because they're a domain expert, they are looking to build reputation, to build, to build a, a presence in the market. And if they do things that are unethical or bad, that will just hurt them, right? Because they won't be able to continue because everyone in the market will know, oh, did this unethical thing or so-and-so did this bad thing and they won't get any deals. They won't get exits, et cetera. So they have to be good stewards of the trade because they're specialists. And then they have an ethical code of conduct on top of that. And so the combination of those two things can lead to really powerful results. Our funds are not very old. 
because the VC lab accelerator itself is only roughly two years old. So the oldest fund is under two years old, which in the world of venture capital is a very short time frame. And we're seeing funds with, you know, 260% IRR, 100% IR, et cetera, in such a short period of time. What that means is that they are performing incredibly well because what happens in venture capital is you make these investments, but they don't get returns for, in many cases, years, but the venture capital fund charges fees. So you have something called a J curve, where when you start the fund for the first few years, the returns are negative. So you'd have negative IRR for the first few years until your companies start getting positive returns and positive exits, et cetera. And then the curve becomes like a J, which is like goes straight up and you make lots of money, right? With many of our funds, we're not seeing the J curve, right? Because they're investing in businesses they know very well. They're making smart decisions. They're behaving ethically and they're reaping better returns. So. From my perspective, being ethical, being specialized, being focused will in fact produce better results. Yeah. And if I add to that also from my own experience in emerging markets, how many people can be successful entrepreneurs, right? If you estimate it conservatively, maybe 0.1%, maybe more, but even if it's just 0.1%, that's 7 million people. Are we funding 7 million people right now? No. So we're really underutilizing entrepreneurs all over the world, and especially in places that don't have a history or access to ethical venture capital, there's often very predatory investors, right? They right. want 50% of you for a very low amount and give you all these very bad terms. Very good point. Okay. If you have a market filled with predatory investors, no talented entrepreneur is going to want to raise money. So then what happens is, this goes back to the glass ceiling. They're going to build businesses that don't require capital, right? Because the options to get capital are unattractive, unfair, unethical, etc. So as a result, of course, you know, you're not going to see unicorns out of markets without a thriving venture capital ecosystem because it takes money to build a billion dollar company. It's possible to bootstrap a large business. I'm not saying that. And I have bootstrap businesses worth hundreds of millions of dollars personally, including the Founder Institute. But with that said, it takes much longer and you have to make constant trade-offs. I can't hire this person because they're too expensive. So I have to hire this person who's less expensive, maybe less talented. I can't open that new office in this region that we might need a new office, but maybe I'll send someone over there to do work. And all these little trade-offs just mean that the businesses that we need today to innovate ourselves out of the problems we're facing can't get critical mass to help humanity achieve a positive outcome in this situation. But that is changing. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Also, in my experience in Central America, many founders and entrepreneurs, they often have two businesses, right? They have a media or an advertising agency to make money so, because they need to make money. And then they have another business that's something more scalable, right? So by giving them money, they can focus on that one business that's scalable. But what I want to understand a bit better is what are the barriers to globalizing venture capital? What makes it so hard to start a venture capital fund? Where do the barriers to entry come from? So the venture capitalists of yesteryear, and maybe we could call them the grand grandparents of the industry or the dinosaurs, depending on how you look at it, they have created walls and moats. Right. And these walls and moats come in many forms. First and foremost, there's a huge regulatory barrier to starting a fund pretty much everywhere in the world. There are general solicitation laws almost everywhere in the world that prevent venture capitalists from raising money publicly. 
So that makes fundraising among the most difficult possible of any asset class. Then the, there's additional regulations that venture capital firms worldwide need to follow in order just to be set up. Banks make it incredibly complicated to set up venture capital accounts, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is just a regulatory and infrastructure barriers that are massive. And again, those have been set up by the grandparents of the industry to protect their franchises from incumbents coming in. They're like, we're going to make it incredibly hard and we're going to put regulatory barriers, banking barriers, logistical barriers, just to put things in perspective. And then of course, like this regu this world of barriers and moats is then only exacerbated by the vendors who are, if there aren't that many players in the space, we don't need that many attorneys. We don't need that many back office professionals. We don't need that many auditors. And we're going to charge through the roof because again, if I can only get 50 or a hundred clients total, and I need to build a business around it, I got to charge a lot. So your lawyers, your fund formation lawyers are in the thousand dollar plus per hour range. Your back office professionals are charging like 50,000 a year and up. Audits are insanely expensive for the level of complexity starting at $25,000 per year for an audit and up. And when you add this to the regulatory barriers and everything else, and a new entrant into the space must be proficient in an incredibly large amount of weird, nuanced rules and regulations. They need to have a lot of money to afford the back office providers, the, the lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. They need to be able to fundraise without talking about what they're doing publicly. So they have to know like lots and lots of rich people right? Number three. And that's just to start, right? That's just to open the door. And then you may or may not actually be a good investor. So in theory, you also have to be a good investor because <laughs> ideally you don't want to open the door as a bad investor and then be like, oh, wow, I've learned all this nuanced stuff. I have tons of money and et cetera, et cetera. And now I've gotten to the door, but I suck as an investor. This is it's a terrible place to be. So you can't even get to the door to realize if you're good at the asset class without having just like an insurmountable amount of wind in your sail. And so what the net effect of that is the asset class itself has seen no innovation and no expansion, okay? No innovation and no expansion in decades. Decade. What's the new model in venture capital? There isn't one. If you look at the number of new funds every year historically, and you map that against the number of funds that are ending, right? There's almost no growth for decades. That's so interesting because what you're saying is right at the heart of also what this podcast is about, you know, many barriers to a lot, to scaling a lot of interesting technologies is often regulatory. And what you're doing with VC Lab is basically unleashing venture capital. Can you tell our listeners a bit more how you do that? One interesting data point is it typically takes 18 to 24 months to start a VC fund. With VC Lab, you have brought it down to at least six months. So how do you do yeah. that? We're at 5.8 right now, average. And of course, there are people that that's an average. So there's some that are less. Um, most are around six. And then there's some that are more. Certainly, it still takes a number of people a year or two to raise a fund, even going through VC Lab. But the average is 5.8. So look, it's first of all, just knowing how to do it. There's no information online. There's no like book you can read about how to launch a venture capital fund. And even if you had written the book on how to launch a venture capital fund, the second the ink was dry on the first edition, it would be invalidated because laws around the world are changing. This is part of the game, right? If you want to keep your moat going, 
you have to change the laws pretty frequently. So Europe changes the laws, the U.S. changes the laws, Asia changes the laws at almost like an annual basis. So even if there was a book, it would be out of date the minute it was finished. So what we do is we've, we've, we're in it every day, right? And because we're in it every day, we've built a curriculum on how to do all the steps to launch a firm. And we're and that curriculum lasts about four months. And then it takes people a little extra time to finish up some details. Now we need to rewrite the curriculum every cohort. So that's once a quarter. And they're not massive rewrites. Little things change, like the pandemic changed things. Right. You used to have to get on a plane and meet limited partners in person. And then with the pandemic, you don't. Now it's changing again because you have to now get on the plane at some point, but not in the first meeting. So whether it's the pandemic, regulatory issues or other things that happen, it's a very dynamic industry by design because the grandparents, incumbents or dinosaurs, whatever you want to call them are constantly trying to move the moat, rebuild the wall and keep outsiders from coming in. So we keep updating the manual, how to get around the wall, swim across the moat, et cetera, so that new entrants can get into the market. There are a lot of other things that we do as well. There are no tools to run a venture capital firm. So what VCs do, by the way, Sequoia has more engineers than partners. Okay. So either they build their own, right? Or they do what's called the VC tax stack, which is a Frankenstein's monster of a CRM and accounting system, insighting system, document tracking system, blah, blah, blah. And they hodgepodge this stuff together to try and run a system to build a venture capital firm. And we said like this, what is this? This is like 1996, right? People are like cobbling together. Oh, I'll get a server and a monitor and this and that will launch a firm. So we said that this is not the way to do things in 2023. So we built a full fledged vertical SaaS solution to run the venture capital firm. It does all of the CRM functions all of the specialized accounting functions, all of the deal management functions in one tool that's integrated and is game changing. We have more users of that tool than the largest other players in the space. And in fact, if you look at the total number of registered firms, we have more registered firms than the entire market of tools for venture capital firms. And it's just because we said, look, we're going to build an integrated solution to run these firms. So th that helps as well, because otherwise you have to go build your own Frankenstein's monster. That's not very good. And th there's a lot of other things that we do. I would say the couple last things would be the community itself is fantastic. Venture capital is a traditionally a lone wolf game. You're even if you're in a partnership, right? Because you don't want your partners taking your deal. So you're going out, you're hunting a deal and closing the deal and you're alone. And a lot of times you don't want your partners to know about your deal until you're ready to have it done because you're afraid they may steal it, right? So even in the firm, it's a lone wolf game. But that's not really a great way to scale because that just makes the passing and best practices even less common. And so what you're seeing is these grandparent firms or dinosaur firms, a lot of them are dying because they haven't succession planned. They haven't trained people and there's no, right? Because they, the, what's the next generation going to do if you're constantly secretive about your deals, how you found them, how you do them, where you're getting them from so that your partners don't usurp you in the partnership, right? So what we've done is we said, that's just not a way to build a viable market. Let's make a community where everyone's sharing everything. And that's been super successful. And last but not least, we bring in really good meaning, good hearted, ethical investors as mentors 
to help the next generation spot mistakes and issues that they might otherwise not be aware of. And so the combination of those different things has really just disrupted the way venture capital works well. Great. I know you have to head out soon. Do you want to give one last shout out who, sh who should engage with VC Lab? What's next for you? Who should reach out to you and how can they find you? Yeah, look, VC Lab is thankfully a success story. And I'm very grateful for everything that's happened because we really do believe that venture capital can be a force for good in the world. And we are going to be instrumental in turning it into a force for good. In the world. So if you're interested in starting a venture capital firm, you can go to govclab.com and we have free events all the time. The accelerator is free. Basically, we try, we're doing this first and foremost to fix the world, right? To address the grand challenges of the world and make the world a better place for our children and for future generations. And we believe that venture capital at this moment in time is the way, the best way to do that. And if you believe that as well, and you believe that venture capital can be a force for good in the world, You can certainly go to govclab.com. And if you're not interested in being a venture capitalist, but you're interested in maybe working at a venture capital firm or joining VC Lab, there's jobs and other opportunities on the site as well. Fantastic. I can only echo how instrumental VC Lab has been for myself and starting my fund. It wouldn't have been possible without you. Thank you so much for bringing this innovation to market at Deo and for allowing and helping unleash venture capital as a force for good. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much. This has been lovely. So unfortunately, Adeo only had a limited amount of time, but I wanted to highlight some of the things we discussed myself and double down on a few of them, because I think there was very rich insights in there. One of which, and the one that's first and foremost, is how much venture capital is held back as an industry by these forces that we've been talking about on a lot on the podcast, by regulatory barriers. And that Deo described very well how these are really the moat that the grandfathers of the industry have set up for themselves. If you think of it, how instrumental venture capital was in making Silicon Valley an engine of progress, then you can also think about how much else it could do if it was free from those shackles. And just to give you a sense, That's something that Adeo didn't get much to talk about when you talk about international domiciles. Nowadays, you can incorporate a venture fund in Delaware, which is something that I chose for Infinita because it's the simplest and cheapest. So it costs roughly 50,000 with VC Lab to get it started through their program and having them set it up for you, which is probably the cheapest as you can get, right? So that they streamlined all the legal documents. They have an expert on for every little detail that they need to get done for you. They manage it for you through the Decile Hub platform, the CRM plus fund management platform that I mentioned, which is really good and really helpful. So that's probably a rock bottom that you can get to. So the next best options to starting a venture fund in Canada or in Europe or in Singapore or in Luxembourg is already at least three to five times more expensive. Right. And you shouldn't even start in many other places around the world. It's almost not really possible. So think about it. You have to put 200 or 300,000 dollars in the hand just to get started. You can only do that if you already have connections to rich people. And then there's things like general solicitation, right? So you can't openly talk that you're raising a fund, right? So that is a regulation that's preventing you from doing a lot of kinds of advertising, some of which aren't advisable in the first place, but you can't really get creative. You have to utilize an existing network, right? So it makes these regulations create this black box around venture capital and are putting insiders at the advantage or people with existing levels of wealth. And that's very tragic because venture capital is, can be a force for good. It's needed all over the world. In the podcast, I mentioned some of my own experiences and what it competes with is very often very predatory 
pricing by by investors, especially in emerging markets that I have experience with in Central America, in in the Middle East and in Asia and and Latin America and Africa. And it's freeing entrepreneurs to really focus on something that can change the world, right? The alternative is that they have to work in another job or have to run another company, which is something that I see all the time in Honduras and Guatemala, because you need to, because there are no funding sources available. So these insights are all very, very rich. Often I get asked, why do you even, Nicholas, why don't you do something like a crypto fund or a DAO? These are less or an unregulated kind of ways of doing the same things. And probably not unregulated because you still need to have a domicile, a jurisdictional wrapper. The reason simply is when I look into that space, I see just many problems are unsolved, right? So what are the right jurisdictional wrappers? Banking is a huge pain and also the laws are changing all the time, as Adeo mentioned, right? So especially if you're in a small jurisdiction or if you're in Europe, things can change all the time. Or if you're in like a Caribbean island, you might be under crossfire of, of regulators. If something like FTX happens, I want to build better legal and financial guardrails through Web3. But at the same time, I think it's important to take away and work with the best practices in traditional finance. And the C-Lab, I think, represents the best of what the traditional rails have to offer, like simplified and streamlined, based in Delaware. So my ambition is really to take those learnings and transfer them over to potential alternative fund structure. Once you can prove that they're ethically viable, that they have the desert, there's a path to legitimacy and things like that, right? Because there is always a risk. Any new industry like crypto, like decentralized finance is under higher scrutiny than the existing, than the existing, than the status quo, right? So everything is looked at it under the looking glass. They try to find things against you if you do something wrong, right? So it's under a lot of crossfire. So you have to do it better, right? So in startups, when you work on a new product, the rule of thumb is you should do it at least 10 times better because the, the market overvalues what they have. They think more highly of the quality of what they have right now than it actually is. And they think of low, they think lower of newer alternative options because they're not educated yet or experienced or see the benefits. And sometimes just the existing power structures are favoring the status quo, right? So venture capital needs to be unleashed even more. I think there is a fundamental from first principles, good idea behind it of providing capital to entrepreneurs who do something very risky with a low chance of success, but with a very high potential for breakout success and for progress, right? I think venture capital has given us the last 20 or 30 years of the technology industry, of Apple's, of Facebook's, of Twitter, and of software and the computing industry of Moore's Law. And that's great. As Adeo has said, it is increasingly ossifying and it is increasingly not fulfilling its purpose anymore of basically driving human progress by funding the entrepreneurs that can make these big changes. So the industry is ripe for disruption. We're going to use better legal and financial guardrails, but we're also going to look what is working, right? We want to take the best of what's already working and combine it with solutions for the things that are not working, right? So in the future, I also plan to look more into sort of a replicating fund structures, for example, with a domicile in Prospera or in the Catawba Digital Economic Zone. These are places where legal innovation is possible, right? So where these are explicitly designed to go around the problems with the legacy system or out the moats that the incumbents have built for themselves and provide regulations that are not that are not regulated, but then there are better, right? In each of those cases, we can't become another or allow another FTX, right? Because each one of those will undermine the whole movement and the whole purpose. Instead, I want to sort of power law some of these jurisdictions, right? If we're able to build 
great businesses, great companies, myself, hopefully a great venture capital fund that is ethical and that's achieving positive outcomes that can also then have a very positive effect and make others imitate it and make other jurisdictions replicate the same legal structures, make more people come, make more people opt into voluntarily or put pressure on their own governments or countries to adopt better regulations that allow their industries to thrive, that allow them to build great businesses. So I was really excited to learn from Adeo, as I said, my Jedi master, how venture capital works, how to start a fund. And I can only recommend to each one of you that's listening, who is thinking about entering VC, or looking at interesting new VC funds to check out the work of VC Lab. So thank you so much for listening and tuning in today.